beginning a new series of messages today entitled One Life to Make a Difference, and we're going to look at the life of the Apostle of Christ named Peter, because when it comes to followers of Christ who have made an impact in advancing the kingdom of God as well as the church of Jesus Christ on planet Earth, well, after the huge impact Christ made by shocking the world, the next name on the disciples of Jesus' goat list, you know, greatest of all time list, may very well be Simon Peter, the fisherman turned fisher of men. Now, some might say it's the Apostle Paul, that he was the biggest difference maker after Christ, but when you look at the Bible's record, we'd have to say there's a lot of positive about Peter's and Peter's favor. Now, there, there are some negatives as well, especially before, before Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit, because yes, Peter could be overly impulsive, okay, like the time he leaped out of the boat to walk on water, which he did for a moment, but then he took his eyes off of Jesus, and before you could say, Bob's your uncle, he was neck deep in water. And yes, it was Peter who told Jesus that he would be willing to die for him, but shortly thereafter, when his neck was actually on the line, Peter denied that he even knew Jesus three times. But let's not forget who it was that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom to. It was Peter. Or after the Holy Spirit was poured out, it was Peter who preached the very first gospel message that resulted in over 3,000 people responding to the message and, and being baptized. And then later on, it was time for the, the Gentiles to receive the good news. It was Peter who was called on to deliver the message to Cornelius and his household. And it was Peter who wrote the two books in the New Testament. And the oldest gospel Mark is believed to have been written after Mark listened to Peter's sermons about the Savior's life. And it was Peter who reminded us to cast all of our anxieties on the Lord, for he cares for you. It was Peter who wrote, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And it was Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And there's much more, right? But what, what say you, church family? Was Peter a big difference maker? Sure. Yeah, he was. And, 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 but here's the interesting question about all that. Does that surprise you? Well, no, when we know about the Holy Spirit, but it probably should. I mean, for it was Peter, the same man who is pictured early on in the Gospels as a rough, uneducated, blue-collar, quick-tempered, quick-to-speak, impulsive person who, when the pressure was on, turned into a back-turning, deny-I-even-knew-you friend and follower. But after the resurrection, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into his life, this unlikely character became one of the most influential, biggest difference makers for the kingdom of God and Christ church of all time. And so we're entitled in this series of messages, One Life to Make a Difference, because that's what we as Christ followers have been called to be with our one and only lives. We're called to be difference makers for the kingdom of God and Christ church. And I pray that's true, and I believe it's true, that we want our lives to count for something eternal, that we want our lives to be a sacrifice that's pleasing to the Lord, that we want our lives to make a difference, right? something that will make a difference to those that follow us, and something that will make a difference even, say, 10,000 years from now. Because it's true that we only have one life, and pray tell, church family, we want them to count, don't we? We do. We do. We want to make a difference. Well, this morning I'd like to, for you to turn in your Bibles or Bible apps to Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Let's do something a little different this morning and stand together for the reading of God's Word. We haven't done this in a long, long time, so if you would stand with me this morning, I'll begin here with verse 1 of Luke chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the Word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets, and he got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and he asked him to put out a little from the shore, and then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, "'Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man.'" For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. You may be seated. Now, 
From this uh, very familiar passage, if you've been in the church long, you've heard this passage a number of times, but from this passage of Peter's life, we see Peter's call to be a difference maker, and how he is to be a difference maker is he's being called to be a fisher of men. So how does that apply to us? Okay, well, to different degrees, this is the call to all disciples of Jesus, to all Christ followers, for we have all been called to be difference makers. I mean, what else is there? I mean, does anyone recall Jesus ever calling anyone to any of this, like ever? Like, hey, follow me by not following. Uh, hey, follow me, but I don't want you to do what you've seen me doing. Hey, follow me, but you, you just go ahead and have your seat, for you've been, you know, from now on, you shall be a spectator. Anybody? No, no, no. We all understand that when we accepted Christ to be our Lord and Savior, that we're accepting a call to participate in the new creation happening on planet Earth, which we refer to as the kingdom of God through the church of Jesus Christ. And we knew we were giving our life to make a sacrifice, right? That there were, that there were, so that we could make a difference for all of eternity. So yeah, we've all been called in one manner or another, for we've all received this great task, this honorable task, really, that being, we've been called to be difference makers for the kingdom of heaven individually and corporately and honestly church family i believe that after all that we've been through the last 14 months a lot of pastors and church leaders are kind of wondering church people too i suppose where will the church what will we be after this what will we be after this will the church respond in a positive and courageous manner or will it just kind of get knocked back to a place that's something you know where we become accustomed to just being something lesser you know i mean where it has no chance of making a difference at all Listen, friends, I know New Lisbon Christian Church is just one church in a state known for little, little churches, little, little towns, but this church has been a bright light burning for Christ and his kingdom for over 120 years, and its people for over 120 years have not only considered a duty and a responsibility to be the light to the world around it, but a privilege as well, I believe. And I have no doubt, meaning I have faith, that we will respond with courage. So without our time this morning, I'd like for us to kind of look back at the characteristics of receiving such a great task. I mean, in, in practical life and faith, when God's people or Christ followers receive an extended call to make a difference, we receive it, don't we? I think so, yeah. Like, I've never known a time, I mean, I, I remember a treasurer in a church one time stand up and say, we just tell God's people what the Lord needs, and they always respond, never known a time, and, and I haven't, I haven't. So I think we must, as Peter. Peter did, he considered it a must, to answer the call, I think we must as well, whatever it may be. Now, for some of you this morning, as longtime Christ followers, you know this text, and this is going to be a refresher course for you. I think it's a good time to have one. For others, it might be your rookie season on the fishing circuit, okay? So here's, to, here's my hope today in this particular season of the church, post-COVID, if you will, and that is that we prepare for this new season that's ahead, okay? As we all come together again for one purpose, it's my hope that, that we'll ready ourselves, if you will. We'll ready ourselves to answer the call that we might do so with the goal or the purpose of making a difference in our communities, in our neighborhoods, for we all have one life, and we ought to make a difference for Christ. So speak to me, church family. Would you agree? Would you agree that if we're going to move ahead and do this and be the church, wouldn't you say we ought to be the church and make a difference? Yes? Okay. Now, we say yes, but who's available? Okay, good. Okay, caught you off guard there. I know it's early, it's rainy, you came in here. Yeah. Who's available? Yeah, that's the question, okay? If you're taking notes, by the way, that's the first point, okay? Who's available to be a difference maker? I mean, that's probably, it's got to be the first characteristic of being a difference maker, and that's to be ready for, you know, takers, you can put down just be available. You have to be available. I mean, if you understand the context here in this passage, this isn't Peter's first encounter with Jesus, right? They knew each other, okay? I mean, he's made time for Jesus before, and Jesus has made time for Peter before. And, and if you've been around the church scene for very long, you know that if you hang out with Jesus much, and Jesus hangs out with you much, at some point, Jesus is going to start messing with you in your life. Do you know this? Have you experienced this church? I'm going to make you speak this morning, so just get used to it, okay? Do you know this church? 
You, yeah, right. I mean, Jesus is going to get involved in your life. And trust me, if you say, Jesus, I give my life to you, I want to be a follower of you, then Jesus isn't going to hesitate. He's going to get right up in the middle of your boat, and he's going to start messing with your life. Now, he'll not press you to go where you're not able to go, but rather he'll meet you right where you are. But the truth is, truth be told, he won't let you stay right where you are very long. Right? He will not. But the point is, to answer the call of Christ, to be a difference maker, putting first things first, you have to be available to go, right? Now, clear, clearly Peter was, even though he was tired, even though he'd been working all night, even though he hadn't accomplished anything with his own skill set. I mean, you know, professionally speaking, he's a fisherman, and thus far, how's it going? Zero, nada, okay? Been there, done that, you know? It's, it's not been good, but he, he let Jesus get right in the middle of his boat. He let him get right in the middle of his business, and he made himself available. So, the very first question I think we ought to ask ourselves as part of this church or, you know, or if you're even considering being a part of this church, I don't know if you feel this way, but I, I think we all do too. But in this season, post-COVID, do you feel kind of like we're rebooting? We're rebooting. I kind of feel that way. Like there was a pause and now we're hitting play again, right? I mean, would you agree? I mean, that's just kind of not just here, just life general. It's kind of like a reboot. So I think this is a real important question if that's where we're at. And that is, are we as a church are we as individual Christ followers, are we available? Are we available to answer the call? I mean, if the Holy Spirit were to nudge you in a certain direction, or if Jesus in your prayer time, or your devotional time, or your neighborhood group time, while you're all, you know, all, and when I say all, I mean, I'm, I'm meaning you and Jesus, right? Okay. Uh, if you're hanging out together, and if he, Jesus, were to kind of dial you up personally, would you receive the call? Or would you maybe reject it and send them the voicemail? I'll get to that later. You know, I'm still not used to that feature on my smartphone. Uh, I'm, I'm not as smart as my phone. But when someone calls and they're not in my contact list, and I have generally everybody I know in my contact list, but if a number comes up that's not in my contact list and you don't know who it is, I, I mean, that's probably a telemarketer, right? Have you experienced this? Right. Okay, and telemarketers may not be the devil, but... <laughs> You know, if I knew for sure it was a telemarketer, then I'd have no problem hitting reject button, right? Get behind me, telemarketer, you know? <laughs> you know? And, 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 but just because it might not be a telemarketer, well, I could hit the decline with a message button, right? Or, or usually what I do is I just usually don't answer, okay? Or if I do, I answer, but I don't speak, right? And I'm waiting for that telltale click, and that's a telemarketer, and then you can hang up, right? You know? And so, I mean, anyone else do this? Okay, you're in church now. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, I'm not alone up here. Okay, how about this? Do you ever do that, any of the above, when it's a name you know? Oh, now I went from preaching to meddling, didn't I? Okay, but listen, I'm talking real life here, right? I like, like the name comes up and instantly you think, well, that's Oh my, well, that's an hour if I answer that one, right? I mean, that's an hour out of my life if I answer So I don't have an hour right now, so I'm unavailable, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, or anybody else besides me? Anybody else do this? Okay, good, because you're not, I mean, because like if you're not answering, you're like kind of like, oh, I see who it is, but I'm not playing, right? So you're kind of doing it right now, right? If you're not, if you're not playing. Oh, now I, I'm going to just assume that you get what I'm talking about, but here's the point. When it's the Holy Spirit that nudges and the Lord Jesus that calls, are you available then? Because what I'm saying is, if there's someone you should just kind of interrupt the normal programming for, shouldn't it be Jesus? Now, if you're new to this whole church thing and you've not yet committed to Jesus in his church, then for you, making yourself available most likely means putting yourself in the right place. Because before Peter received this call from Jesus, okay, this right place for Peter was just hanging around where Jesus was hanging around, okay? In other words, Jesus said to Peter, he really did, come and see, come and see, see who I am, see what I'm like, okay? Just come and see, sit and listen, which is kind of what you're doing here today, right? I mean, I mean what we're all doing here today is the beginning stages, okay? Uh, but, but there's other ways to do that too. The food packing in a few weeks, uh, Jesus will be present there as well, and his people doing the work and feeding the hungry, Jesus will be there. I mean, if we look back into Peter's life, he was first introduced to Jesus by, anybody know? His brother, 
Andrew, yeah, and Peter came and he saw and then he sat and he listened as Jesus talked about himself and as he talked about the kingdom of God. In other words, he just hung around and kind of absorbed all things Jesus, okay? So for you, if you're new to the church scene, you're in the right place. You're in the right place because here you'll find Jesus, you'll find studies about Jesus, you'll find people who know Jesus. And trust me, if you just hang out long enough around Jesus, you know, he'll, eventually he'll just come up in your boat. He'll come up into your heart and he'll ask, can I come aboard? He will, right? I, I mean, I think it was 10, 12 years ago, a young man from another town visited here at this church uh, with a friend. In fact, I think it was Friends Sunday. I'm pretty certain of it. It was Friends Sunday. And he was somewhat new to the whole Christian church thing. He had a church background, but it wasn't evangelical churches, you know. And, and, and so to say the least, he was a little bit apprehensive, but he, he was pleasantly surprised when the music started. Uh, this is not what I expected in the church, he thought, you know. And then the sermon started, and, and, and the sermon made sense to him, and the spirit began to draw his heart in, and it scared him a little bit, okay? Actually, it was me that scared him, okay? Uh, it was me that scared him. He told me, you know, the church had already passed the communion, which he referred to as, you know, the red juice, okay? And, and then he said, you started to communi communicate in a way I could understand, and I felt myself being drawn in. I thought to myself, oh my goodness, they've served the red juice. The speaker's drawn me, and this, could be, this guy could be a cult leader. Okay, this is how, this is how they get you to drink the Kool-Aid. True story. This is what he told me, okay? Well, long story short, he went to another Christian church in Indy the next week, East 91st Street, to be precise, just to be sure, he said, just to be sure. And he, and he experienced the same kind of experience there, and he thought, well, phew, like, they're all the same. It's all good. It must be okay, you know? About a year later, he accepted Christ as his personal Lord and Savior and was baptized. And about two, uh, a year or two later, I prayed a prayer of blessing on his wedding day as he and my youngest daughter, Cassie, were married. And today, they're active in their church and they're raising their children to love Jesus and love the church. It all began when he made himself available. Now, last week, we announced that starting on Sunday, June 6th, we, we're going to basically bring all our ministries back up to full speed. I mean, that's the goal, okay, to be operating at the same capacity as before the pandemic. And, and I also, what I also mentioned is, is that for that to actually be able to happen, everyone in the church family is going to have to knock the rest off their volunteer service and pitch in, okay? I mean, every ministry team leader right now is, is talking to me and saying pretty much the same thing. We need people to come back and pitch in, okay? And, and the truth is, our job as staff and leaders of the church is to help the members of the church family find their places to pitch in, right? Their place of service, okay? Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 speaks to this truth when it says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, which is the leadership gifts of the church. And what are they supposed to do? Well, it says, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The point is this, that we teach this as a church value, a core value, and that is that to be used by God to build up the body of Christ to make an eternal difference for the kingdom, we as a church, we as individuals, need to place ourselves in a place where God can bless us. And he does that, he blesses us by using us. And that all begins by listening for his call. Now, answering that call may come in a form of some spiritual goal that you've already set, okay? In other words, maybe something he's led you in personally, like making a commitment to be in worship every week or waking up earlier each day to spend that time in prayer or changing your perspective about your work or your school and seeing those around you like Jesus sees them. I mean, the call could be, it could come in a variety of different ways. I don't know. I don't know what your spiritual goals are, what they might be, but I chose some new normals back months ago when I preached a sermon series entitled The New Normal. Anybody remember preaching that series? Okay, The New Normal, okay. Now, some people thought when I preached that series, it was all about discovering a, a, a new method or a new ministry method or, you know, uh, something physical kind of type thing, and, and that could be part of the equation, but for me, the spiritual goals were more mental, okay, which are spiritual as well, and here's the primary one. There were a number, but this is the primary one. In ministry, like a lot of professions, I suppose, where you serve people, there are situation outcomes where people please you, and there are situation outcomes where people disappoint you, and it's no different in ministry. I always thought ministry is a lot like being the parent of adult children, right? You can say, but they, they, they do what they want, right? It's a lot like that, okay? Sometimes they heed your advice. 
Sometimes they don't, okay? Sometimes they respond to your call to action, and sometimes they don't. And the truth is, there's probably more good than bad by a long shot in the ministry, but the bad, because you care, because they are your spiritual children, I mean, there's a weight there to carry. Now, the Holy Spirit's trying to teach me that it's his weight and not mine, okay? But sometimes, as a child of God myself, I'm kind of stubborn about heeding his advice, okay? Anyway, to heed the Spirit's advice, my new normal goal is to have a greater faith. I know that sounds simple, but it's not, okay? A greater faith, a greater faith in God that he can do more than I think, so I can think bigger. Okay, I have to have I, I need to have a greater faith in God's word that preaching its truths are, are strong and powerful, just like the Bible says, and I can trust that it's more enough to get the job done. I need to have a greater faith in the Holy Spirit that he convict he can convict people of sin and change people's lives and he doesn't need me to do it. Okay? And to have a greater faith that God's people will respond to all the above, and I should just trust that they, that you will. Now that sounds simple. But for me, it's not so much. But that's my new normal of a greater faith. So basically, the spiritual goal of my new normal is to take captive any negative thoughts about God or the church or his people and make them obedient to Christ and do not doubt. Now, to be clear, I've always had faith, but the goal is to cast aside all doubt and think bigger, dream God-sized dreams, and minister with a greater faith. In short, I'm making myself available. And my faith is that you will too. That's part of my greater faith, okay? Now, which leads right into our second step, which is be obedient, okay? And the truth is, sometimes the way we sense our calling is just by being obedient to some things, okay? For, for me, again, in verse 5, here, let's look at this. Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, and because you say so, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. I love that part, okay? But, okay, uh, and it's not the way when we say but it usually goes, but with Peter it does. This is the part of faith that's so exciting. I mean, to me it reads, obey me even when it doesn't make sense to you. Obey me even when it's not what you want to do, okay? And let me tell you, as a type C personality, when it goes against my research and my experience, because we, type, we see type personalities, we always know the best way. Just ask us, right, okay? I mean, because... Because we know it's tried and it's true and we've seen it before and this is the way you get it done right. Right? You see? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And the Lord comes along and then he says, yeah, well, I want you to try something new or I want you to try something different or I want you to try something way bigger than you think is possible, okay? Something that you would normally say, no, I don't think so, not on my watch, okay? But he calls you to a normal, a greater faith and says, go ahead, let your net down. Are you with me, church family? Because if you are, then, then what say you? What would you do if you were in that boat? And remember, Peter's not an apostle of Christ yet. He doesn't know Jesus is the promised Messiah at this point. Now, he's, which is what we know. So he didn't know what we know, okay? And, and he, and, but he's been coming, and he's been seeing, and he's been sitting and listening for a while now. And I mean, they've been hanging out together. But Peter's tired, and he's ready to call it a day. And this is an area of his expertise. Peter knows fishing, okay? And so this is something he knows isn't going to work. It's something that experience tells him it's just foolishness, right? And, but we all know what Peter ends up saying, right? Speak to me. Yeah, we know. But, but would you have said that? I mean, if you were in the boat that day, what would you do? What would you, would you go back out after cleaning the nets? Do you know what I mean cleaning the nets? It means he's prepped for the next day. You dirty up those nets, you got to prep again, lose sleep, stay up all night, or just miss a day's work. So would you go out and cast the nets again? Or would you say, listen, Rabbi, I know you're a man of God and all, but listen, I, I, I do this for a living. Now, you, you, you know books and you know how to make a good speech and all, but this is, this is who I am. This is what I do. Listen, no offense, but I'm tired and I'm hungry and I'm not throwing out on this side or that side of the boat and dirty these nets again when there are no fish there to be caught. No offense, you're calling me to fish, I get it, and I appreciate the call, but I think I'll pass on this one. Thank good. I mean, maybe we would. Thank goodness Peter didn't go, right? I mean, Peter didn't say or do any of that, right? I mean, think about what was happening. You know, what, what's hanging in the balance for Peter here? And the whole world, really. 
There's a lot hanging here, you know? And, and think about the differences obedience made when they pulled up those nets of the fish. I mean, think, let's just forget the spiritual. Think about it professionally. Think about the windfall of profits they just pulled out, right? Like they're going to set the market. There's so many fish. And think about the reward that they would have received for such a little thing. Right? Like, like, if he's not being called to be a preacher, this is still a pretty good day, right? I mean, I mean, just one, one little cast the net in, and he's wealthy, right? Just for being obedient. And the point is this. To be a difference maker for God, we have to obey even when it goes against what we want to do. Like waiting until you're married to be sexually intimate, or like obeying the boss even when he's not looking, or, or not repaying evil with evil, but repaying evil with good, or giving generously, trusting that it'll be given to you. Bottom line, when you're seeking God's call in your life, you begin by obeying in the little things, which means if you're an experienced fisherman and Jesus tells you to cast again over there, you better do it, right? Listen, friends, this is a principle you're going to find throughout the Bible, and it's simply this. Please listen. To those who are faithful with little, they will be trusted with much. Be available, be obedient, and the third characteristic needed to be a difference maker for Christ is be humble. Now, being a fisherman who knows the ego of a fisherman, especially a good fisherman, I like the way Peter, the professional fisherman, reacts. I mean, the net is full of fish. It's the catch of a lifetime, and here's how Peter doesn't react. He doesn't, like, he doesn't act like, yeah, seen that, done that before, been there before, even posted some pictures on Facebook, right? You know what I'm talking about? No, instead, Peter admits his sin. He admits Jesus' righteousness, and by doing so, he risks the relationship here because he's admitting that he, Jesus, is much greater than he, Peter, even when it comes to fishing, right? Like in Luke 5, 8, it says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Now, why would Peter say that? Well, because Peter knew. It isn't, it, it, he's not in the same league of Jesus in any category, right? In fact, no one was, for he realizes now he's in the presence of God, which when you think about it, Peter's admission reveals a spirit of humility, which is one of the most important qualities of someone that's going to be used by God. Bottom line, Peter believed his sin disqualified him from any acts of service, from being used to make a difference for Christ. And you know what? In a way, he's right. Okay, in fact, most of us, I mean, if we know... Peter's life before the Holy Spirit. I mean, most of us, knowing those inconsistencies in Peter, we wouldn't let him, we wouldn't give Peter the keys to our car, let alone the keys to the kingdom, you know? So, in a sense, Peter was right because really none of us deserves to be used by God. But truth be told, God doesn't really need any of us, not one, okay? And yet, by his grace, he calls us to, and he invites us to in spite of our sin. But an important characteristic of those called to make a difference for Christ and kingdom is humbleness, okay? It's an admission that we're sinful while he's not. It's that we're unworthy, but he is righteous. And the Bible says it this way the best, I think. It's very simply, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The fourth characteristic from Peter's life is be willing. I know that sounds a lot like be available, but it's really not. There's an old hymn, I bet you know it, it goes like this. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. And you can finish the end. I'll go with him, with him, all the way. Yeah. How many of you know that song? How many of you sung it? Yeah. We do. And true to Peter's personality, it didn't take very long for him to buy in to Jesus as Lord, okay? Most people probably take longer, but Peter, he always gets there pretty quick, okay? But Peter, after hearing Jesus' teachings as they hung out together and then seeing the miraculous catch of fish, Peter's ready to become a Christ follower, meaning he's all in. It's all about that last verse in the passage. That's how we know. Luke 5, verse 11, that says, so they pulled their boats up on the shore, left everything, and followed him. They left everything. You know, those three words will separate the fans from the followers every time, won't they? But Peter, Peter abandoned the nets immediately, followed Jesus, left his vocation, in part, left his family to go on the road with Jesus. I mean, he followed an itinerant preacher who had no money, no place to sleep, with no promise of future riches other than the kingdom of heaven. Now, someone may ask, well, are we all called to the life of an apostle like Peter? No. Are we all called to leave all or everything behind? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, not, not all maybe like Peter, but 
we all, you know, some, some are called like Peter to be what Peter was, but we as disciples are all to be available and willing, okay? Whatever it is. But here's the question we need to answer. Looking back over your journey as a follower of Jesus thus far, what have you been willing to leave behind in order to become a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ? Can you look behind you and see something sacrificed? Can you look to the future and say, if Jesus calls me to a great task, an honorable task, I'm willing to abandon what? All? The way? Can you sincerely, where, where he leads me, I will follow, go all the way. And listen, friends, as Christ followers who know they have a personal relationship with the master, we know. I mean, if you walk down that aisle, you knew, right? It's about giving it all. Like, take my life, right? Take my life, Lord. And that means sacrificing followers, okay? That means we become sacrificing followers. I mean, Jesus made it very clear the cost of being a disciple so that we knew what we were getting into, and we know this verse. Luke 9, 23, 24, we read this. Then he, meaning Jesus, said to them all, as in all, okay, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. Which raises the very same question once again, what are you willing to lose in your life? What are you willing to leave behind? What are you willing to sacrifice in your life for Christ that you may find life? So first he says, come and see. Then he says, sit and listen. And then he says, come follow me. We're going to go on an adventure. We're going to go on an adventure, which means be willing, okay? The last point is be alert to open doors. <coughs> You know, sometimes we do things in the church, and, and I think we know, and I, I know we know, but I think sometimes we forget, okay? Like each week at the end of a service, and uh, I lead you in prayer. You know, we should understand that that's corporate prayer, right? That we're praying together, and I hope we are, I believe we are. We praise God, but each week, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but we praise God that we've been blessed with the riches of Christ, and then we pray out of our blessing that we might f go forth and be a blessing, right? Are you familiar with that? Every week, we you know, pretty much pray that same prayer. The purpose of that is to prepare ourselves as we leave for opportunities, okay? I mean, it's a prayer for open doors, if you think about it, that the Lord will provide us opportunities for us to use our gifts, for us to use our talents, for our personalities to be used for Christ. Now, Jesus once summarized the entire scriptures by citing two of God's commands. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors as yourself. And, and, and that's everything in a nutshell. So bottom line, church family, the primary way we've been called to make a difference in the world around us as kingdom workers is to love, right? Love the Lord with all that we are and love our neighbors, those all, all around us. As, wherever we go, as we go, we're to be a blessing to others. This is essentially what Peter did. Wherever he went, he shared what he had. Remember when he said, well, we don't have silver and gold, but we'll give you what we have, the love of Christ right? And it was the same Peter who years later wrote in 1 Peter 2.12, encouraging his church family, he wrote, live such good lives among the pagans. We got pagans out there? We do, okay. Yeah, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, do they ever accuse you of doing wrong? Yeah, the world accuses us of doing wrong all the time. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. It'll make sense to him then, okay, if not before. So let me ask you again, what will God call you to? For not all Christ followers are called, as Peter was. Not all are called to be vocational preachers or missionaries. Perhaps for you, it's volunteering at one of our community's food banks or giving a helping hand in this homeless shelter or a soup kitchen or a Christian love center. You know, we have one of those in town. Perhaps for you, it will be the people on your street. Maybe you'll be called to assist someone who's poor with your resources, or maybe you'll be called to assist somebody that's wealthy because they have no friends. Perhaps someone disabled, someone who's lonely, maybe a single mother who has a house full of kids. Something simple. Just give them a break. Give her a break, right? Listen, I don't know. I don't know what God's going to call you to, but this I do know. And that is, I can't think of a single person who has ever answered the call of God in order to make a difference in the world who hasn't had to make a sacrifice in order to say yes to God. I mean, there's always a cost, right? So what is God asking you to give up? The bigger paycheck, 
the boyfriend or the girlfriend that's not good for you, vacation time for a mission trip, pride, there's a big one, pride that you might invite a friend to church, what great sacrifice is he asking of you that he might use you to connect others to Jesus Christ? I mean, ultimately, as kingdom workers for Christ, isn't that the difference we hope to make in the world? For you and I, we are kingdom workers. Listen, friends, you know, you know what I love most about this story? It's the way it begins. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, look again, with, if you would, at Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what it says. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So there's a group of people around Jesus listening to the word of God preached. But that's not the part. That's the part that we normally focus on, but that's not the part I want us to focus on. It's right there at the beginning, where it simply begins one day. In other words, it was a day like any other day, as Peter was going about his business. And then something happened on that day, and that something was Peter became a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And not he nor the world around him were ever the same again. For the Lord used him in his one life to make a difference. Now, Peter had been hanging around Jesus before for a year and a half, to be precise. They'd been hanging around each other. But on this day, Peter was called beyond the stage of coming and seeing and sitting and listening. And for on that one day, he was called to become a difference maker. And what a difference Peter went on to be, right? Which kind of should make us wonder. It kind of begs the question. I mean, here we all are in a place where their crowd has gathered to honor Jesus and hear the word of God preached. We've come to see, and we've come to sit and listen. I mean, do you suppose that Jesus might use this one day, this day right here, right now, as the day? Could it be some of you are to leave your nets behind and follow him and love others? He's calling you to something? I wonder, I wonder. I mean, we pray for it every week. Lives will be changed. But here's the real question we each must ponder. If Jesus should call, if he should call, are you available? Will you be obedient, humble yourself, and be willing to walk through that open door, the door that Christ himself has provided you? How about you and your life? For only you, you only have one life, only one life to make a difference. What say you? Let's pray. Father, we come today, and uh, Lord, for many of us, this is a very familiar passage. But it's one that we often think about Peter and what Peter, what this meant for Peter. But Lord, we, we pray today that you'd open our hearts and help us to see that the Holy Spirit would lead us as to what it means for us. We know what the word says, but Lord, what's it mean to us? How are you calling us? What should we be available to? What do we need to be obedient to? What is it, Lord? So we, we lift up our lives before you, Lord, and, and for the most part here, we're believers. We're followers. We, we walked down an aisle years ago, and we confessed you as our Lord and Savior, but Lord, today is a new day, and we're looking at a new time period in the season of the church where we're kind of hitting reboot. So Lord, help us find our way as a church and as individual Christ our followers, Lord, we pray that you would show us the path before us that you're calling us to, that we might make a difference in our community, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, wherever we go, that we might be a blessing to others. We pray it would be so to the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.